Hello everyone, welcome to my General Hospital official channel. I hope everyone is having a wonderful day. Before we begin, please hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. Lucy stopped by the Quartermain mansion to talk to Tracy about the lawsuit. Lucy wanted to know what Tracy's evidence was, but Tracy pointed out that Lucy's attorney would receive everything during the discovery phase. Ignoring Lucy's continued demands for answers, Tracy suggested that Lucy could easily resolve the lawsuit by signing over 75% of deception to Tracy. Lucy informed Tracy that she had no intention of settling the lawsuit because she didn't believe that Tracy had the schematics for the deceptor. Prove you got something. Show me what you got, Lucy said. Tracy explained that she'd been advised by her attorney not to discuss the case. Frustrated, Lucy accused Tracy of trying to steal the deceptor through legal intimidation because Tracy was out for revenge. Tracy didn't take the bait. Instead, Tracy fetched the contract for Lucy to sign, but Lucy tore it up. Lucy insisted that she had put her heart and soul into deception, and she refused to give it away for a measly percentage. Tracy invited Lucy to make a counteroffer, prompting Lucy to suggest a 50% split. Tracy laughed and counted with 65 35 percent split, but Lucy rejected the offer. Tracy warned Lucy that Lucy's options were limited because deception would slide into oblivion as the case dragged its way through the court system. Lucy agreed to settle if Tracy agreed to take 60% of the company and a clause in the contract that would protect Lucy's position as CEO and any position on the board. Tracy admitted that she'd always been able to bank on one thing about Lucy. You're a grifter, Tracy said. How about 51 49ths? Tracy asked. Lucy's eyes narrowed. Deal, Lucy replied. Tracy revealed that the agreement would be contingent on Lucy returning a 1% voting rights in ELQ. Shocked, Lucy accused Tracy of waiting years to spring that on her, because Tracy hated that Lucy had the 1% interest in Tracy's family legacy. Annoyed, Tracy insisted that Lucy had warned her way into the Quartermain family and exploited Alan's weakness by having an affair with Tracy's brother while he'd been married to Monica. Lucy argued that Monica hadn't been without blame because Monica had slept with Ned. Tracy reminded Lucy that Lucy had blackmailed Tracy into appointing Lucy as co-CEO. That is one of my biggest regrets, Tracy admitted. Lucy insisted that it was ancient history, but Tracy explained that she wanted to prevent the quartermain ship from running aground, and it was up to Tracy to get the family back on course. Tracy revealed that it was time to scrape everything off that didn't belong, including Lucy. 1% voting rights in ELQ, and that's my final offer, Tracy said. Never, Lucy replied. After Lucy stormed out, Tracy called her mystery partner to report that their mutual friend had just left. Tracy was certain that Lucy would fold, and she assured her partner that it was the perfect time for a visit. Port Charles is beautiful in the fall, Tracy said. At Chase and Brooke Lynn's apartment, Brooke Lynn and Chase shared a kiss. Brooke Lynn wanted Chase to call in sick, but she knew that he wouldn't. Chase suggested that he could be late, and he kissed her again. They were interrupted by a knock at the door. It was Maxie. After Chase left for work, Brooke Lynn tried to break the tension by asking about Maxie's move, but Maxie explained that she wasn't there to catch up. Maxie wanted to know why Brooke Lynn had helped Tracy. Maxie accused Brooke Lynn of taking advantage of her friends and Maxie's trust in order to steal information about the company's most valuable product. Yes, Maxie, that's exactly what I did, Brooke Lynn tearfully admitted. Brooke Lynn apologized, and she promised that she'd had no idea what Tracy had intended. Maxie was skeptical because Tracy always had an agenda. Brooke Lynn explained that she'd been desperate and indebted to her grandmother. And this is how she collected, Brooke Lynn said. Brooke Lynn confessed that she had reached out to Tracy for help securing a second hearing with the review board for Chase, and Tracy had collected on the favor by blackmailing her. Stop. I've heard enough, Maxie shouted. Maxie reminded Brooke Lynn that her actions had put Maxie's job and livelihood at risk, all because Brooke Lynn had been unable to be honest with her boyfriend. 
Didn't he break up with you once before because you lied to him? Have you learned nothing? Maxie asked. Brooke Lynn explained that she loved Chase, and she'd been weak because she'd feared losing him. Maxie was unmoved because Maxie and Brooke Lynn had been through a lot with Bailey Lou. Why didn't you trust me, Brooke Lynn? Maxie asked. Maxie was certain that she and Brooke Lynn could have thwarted Tracy. Instead, you betrayed me, Maxie said. Brooke Lynn claimed that she'd been too ashamed and stupid, and she had thought that she could handle Tracy on her own. However, she hadn't foreseen Sasha's meltdown on television or the deceptor being their only moneymaker. Brooke Lynn promised to do everything in her power to fix things by waging a social media campaign against Tracy, but Maxie explained that Brooke Lynn was untrustworthy. You're fired, Maxie said in a cold tone. Brooke Lynn tearfully pleaded for another chance, but Maxie left. At the Jerome Gallery, Ava was not pleased when Mason strolled in during closing hours, but he was unapologetic because the door had been unlocked. Ava made it clear that she had nothing to say to him, but he told her to shut up. You set us up. The boss is pissed. That's not good, Mason said in a menacing tone. Ava remained calm as she ordered Mason to leave, or she would call the police. You're trespassing, Ava said. Mason reminded Ava that he had evidence to prove that she had murdered her ex-husband, but Ava insisted that she had done her part. Mason accused Ava of double-crossing them, because the evidence that Betty had retrieved had been false. Mason suspected a setup because Sonny had been warned. Ava reminded Mason that she wouldn't have wanted Sonny to know about her role in Nicholas' death, and she quickly put the blame on Betty. She pointed out that Sonny was a smart man, and he'd been more than capable of picking up on the sociopathic gleam in Betty's eyes. Alva suggested that Betty's sweet act hadn't been convincing, and Sonny had figured out that Betty was a plant. Ava could tell that she had planted some doubt, so she assured him that she had no desire to endanger her life or the lives of those she cared about by telling Sonny anything. We'll be in touch, Mason said. After Mason left, Ava called Austin. She left him a voicemail message informing him that his cousin had stopped by and made crazy accusations. Ava warned Austin that if Mason dragged her down, she would take Austin with her. At Carly's house, Sonny joined Carly in the living room after spending time with Donna and her paper dolls. Carly admitted that things hadn't been great in Donna's doll world, and she was curious how he had explained his absence to their daughter. Sonny revealed that he'd told Donna that the FBI had made a mistake, and he had stayed until it had been cleared up. He promised that he'd assured Donna that everything was good, and there was nothing to worry about. We both know that's not true, Carly said. Sonny and Carly sat down and talked about the arrest. It's almost like you knew the FBI was going to bust you, Carly said. Sonny confessed that he'd left some false breadcrumbs for his enemies. What enemies? Carly asked. That's what I'm going to find out, and I will, Sonny vowed. Sonny opened up to Carly about Austin and Mason's boss pressuring Ava to help, but he was careful not to share any details about the blackmail against Ava. Carly asked if Sonny was protecting Ava, so he clarified that it wasn't good for Avery's mother to be caught in the middle of something shady. Sonny told Carly about the plot against Pilar and that he had fed false information to Betty, which Austin and Mason had taken back to their boss. Carly suddenly recalled Sonny asking about Austin's visit to Pentonville. Sonny confirmed that he suspected Austin's boss was in Pentonville because the only connection between Betty stealing the false information and Sonny's arrest was Austin's visit to the prison. Sonny explained that he had both men followed, and Mason had spent time with a working girl, while Austin had gone to Pentonville. Sonny theorized that Austin had given the information to the boss, and the boss had passed it along to the FBI. Sonny suspected that Austin's boss had hoped to take him down or score points with the FBI, or both. Sonny admitted that he needed Carly's help, but Carly wanted to know if it would endanger Drew or affect his sentence in any way. Sonny promised that it wouldn't. Relieved, Carly acknowledged that things had changed between her and Sonny, but she would help. What do you need me to do? Carly asked. Sonny told her that he would tell her on their way to Pentonville. 
At the police station, Mac asked for an update on the search for Sasha and Cody, but a police officer behind the desk reported that there hadn't been any new information. Moments later, Jordan walked in and asked to speak to Mac privately. After Mac led Jordan to the interrogation room and closed the door, Jordan asked Mac about Sonny's arrest and the escape from Ferncliff. What the hell is going on here, Mac? Jordan asked. Mac assured Jordan that he knew Cody, and he was certain that Cody had no intention of hurting Sasha. Jordan reminded Mac that the incident had been reported as a kidnapping, but Mac admitted that he suspected otherwise. Jordan trusted Mac's instincts, but reminded him that both Cody and Sasha remained fugitives, and they needed to be found. In the squad room, Chase overheard Agent Moss ask for Mac. Chase offered to take the FBI agent to the interrogation room, so Moss followed him. When Moss saw Jordan, he asked to speak to Mac privately, but Mac assured the agent that both Chase and Jordan could be trusted. Mac explained that Chase was a detective, and Jordan was the acting mayor, who had also been the previous police commissioner and was an ex-DEA agent. Agent Moss revealed that Sonny's arrest had been a result of a tip that Sonny had been illegally transporting classified weapons, but the charges had been dropped because the confiscated crates had been filled with coffee beans rather than restricted weapons. Jordan suggested that Sonny had been a step ahead of the FBI, but Agent Moss assured her that it wouldn't always be the case. Moss explained that the FBI had reason to believe that Sonny was involved in the trafficking and sale of restricted weapons, and the investigation remained ongoing because there were possible ties to both the government and private sectors. Mac offered to help, so Moss asked to be notified if there was any reason to suspect Dant of feeding his father information or aiding Sonny in any way. At the penthouse, Dant was on the phone with Anna when Sam arrived home from Yo the class. He promised to call Anna when he had an update and ended the call. After he greeted Sam with a kiss, he suggested that they talk about Cody and Sasha. Sam was reluctant to share anything with Dant because she wanted him to have plausible deniability, but he explained that he couldn't ignore what had happened with Cody and Sasha. Dante assured Sam that he appreciated her concern, but he wanted to protect her because she had become an accessory to Cody's crimes, including the assault of Dr. Montag. Sam was shocked to learn that Dr. Montag had been Sasha's doctor. She told Dante about her encounter with the doctor at the hospital during Cody's initial evaluation and the phone call that Montag had received from Gladys. Sam pointed out that it was not a common name. She retrieved Montague's business card and showed it to Dant as she explained how she and the doctor had discussed card games and his invitation for her to join a high-stakes game. Dante realized that Montague had been referring to the card games at the Savoy. And we both know that Gladys loves to gamble, Sam said. Dante was certain that Gladys had met Montague at the card games, so Sam reminded Dante that Cody had played poker for Selena Wu, and Cody had revealed that Gladys had lost a lot of money. Dante realized that it was convenient for Gladys to have access to Sasha's money, but he wondered if Gladys would use Sasha's funds to repay her debts. It certainly seems like that, Sam said. Sam pointed out that, until recently, Sasha had been doing well and taking steps to end the conservatorship. Gladys had to make sure Sasha stayed mentally unfit, Sam said. Dante was furious that Gladys and Montague had been working together to keep Sasha under their control. He admitted that he had never liked nor trusted Gladys because she continually lied, but he thought her harmless and that she would do right by Brando's widow. Dante regretted that he hadn't listened to Cody, but Sam reminded him that Cody had given Dante reason to distrust him. However, Cody had rescued Sasha. I think he saved her life, Sam said. Dante explained that he needed to talk to Cody, so he asked Sam to take him to where they were hiding. At an undisclosed location, Cody woke up alone in the cabin. He frantically looked around for Sasha, but he quickly relaxed when he found her on the porch, enjoying the fresh morning air. Sasha confessed that she recalled lying in her bed at Ferncliff, wishing that she could be outside with the sun on her face. And here I am, because of you, Sasha said. Cody worried that she might be angry, 
but she assured him that she'd never been more grateful to anyone in her life. Cody was curious what Sasha recalled, so she told him that she had been in a lot of pain, and she'd been afraid that someone, Cody, would hurt her. However, she acknowledged that he'd sat with her and helped. Cody explained that she'd gone through severe withdrawal symptoms. Sasha frowned because she'd been accused by her doctor and nurses of using drugs in Ferncliffe, but she promised that it hadn't been true. Cody assured her that he believed her, and he knew who had been drugging her. It was Dr. Montague, Cody said. Sasha recalled that Montague had given her injections, but he had claimed that they had been to help her get off drugs, even though Sasha had insisted that she hadn't been taking any. Cody asked about the medication that Sasha had been taking. She revealed that she'd been on antidepressants for months without any issues, but things had suddenly changed when Dr. Montelic had prescribed her medication for anxiety. Cody was curious what the name of the medication was, but Sasha confessed that she had no idea because Montelic had handed her a bottle of pills with instructions. Sasha admitted that the shoplifting incident had happened shortly after she had taken Montelic's medication. Cody was certain that the doctor had drugged Sasha, but she wondered what would motivate Montelic to take such a step. Cody explained that Montauk had been paid by the person who had motive to drug Sasha. Your mother-in-law, Gladys, Cody said. So what do you guys think about this update? Let me know in the comments below. And if you like my videos, please press like and subscribe for more. I'll see you guys next time.